I'm glad to be here tonight. The uh, month of June is when we had the Italy trip, and we left on a Wednesday, and we're gone two weeks and came back on a Wednesday. And what that means is that included three Wednesdays that Rocky was teaching in Galatians. So thank you, Rocky, for that. Um, and so then we've had our singing, and now here we are conti continuing our study in Galatians. Some of you have asked what we'll be doing next. What we're doing now that we've completed Acts, uh, we are uh, looking at the Pauline epistles in order. And so to that end, we've looked first at 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Now we're looking at uh, Galatians. And um, so we're going to be looking, um, going to be looking at, uh, what are we looking at next? First Corinthians is coming up next. So that's coming up next. And we'd, we'll be taking First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, and um, we'll be looking at, uh, at Romans. Okay, so we're taking these in order, and then of course the four epistles that are sometimes called prison epistles, and go from there. We'll, Lord willing, look at all 13 of them in that order. And the ones he wrote after Acts continues and concludes. Okay, so uh, you don't have the questions yet. And um, I think what I'd like to do is just, uh, not, th not that we'll need these tonight, but let me go ahead and pass these out right here at the beginning of class. And I'll tell you, let's do this just efficiently as possible. And instead of having two guys, let's have four guys and just quickly cover the ground here, if you don't mind. And uh, here, y'all just divvy that up. And uh, here's Russell on this side. So just into four areas, please. And uh, we'll go from there. And so it's Galatians 6. These have not been passed out yet, so everybody needs one. Russell, are you going to have enough there? You're running out. Now, what I'm wondering is, how do we have three guys over here on this section? I mean, what's going on here? We're not sharing your book. Okay, Russell, do you need some? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who Does anyone not have a copy yet? Okay, this section here, let's hit this section here behind you, Russell. Right over here, Bill. Anybody else? Just this section here. Okay, now does everybody have a copy? Everybody? Nathan, you're good, everybody? By the way, good to have you all back. You've been everywhere. Did you bump into the Davises? Did you all crisscross? You all kind of did the same general direction, didn't you? Okay, well, that, that's fair enough. Anyway, good. That, glad that you all are safely back. Cheryl, that's uh, the remainder. Thank you, brethren, for helping me. Okay, so now you have them. Um, what we've seen in the book of Galatians is that this short letter six chapters has three points. And it's easy to remember how they unfold. It's one and two, three and four, five and six. And the first, it, it's like Paul has a proposition, sets it forth, and he's, he builds his case. We know it's, it's all inspired, and yet there's, there's an orderly way that he's going about this. His first point is, I am truly an apostle. I received the gospel that I preached by revelation. Didn't learn it from any man. And so I'm not, and of course he's not saying he's superior to somebody else, but he's not inferior 
to any of the apostles. He is truly an apostle. His message is by revelation. First two chapters establish that. And the, the individual points that he made, like when he gets into the matter of, for example, of needing to rebuke Peter. Why would he bring up something like that? Well, it, it's, it's in connection with his building the case. He is genuinely an apostle. And if a fellow apostle stood in need of correction, as Peter did that time, then he did that. So it's not, uh, anyway, that, so, but every point he's making like that, uh, it's, it's building his case. Okay, second point is, it's specifically defending the gospel. That the gospel uh, deals with justification by a system of faith. Remember we said faith is not just believing, which we know that is believing, it's trusting. But the way the word is used, when faith is contrasted with law, the, the two systems that are in opposition one to another, justification by law, as we saw, would mean, you can only talk about it theoretically, because what it would mean is you never, ever sinned. Only Jesus was in that category. So this is why Paul could say, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It required sinlessness, and all have sinned. So the system by faith is because of what Jesus did through faith in him. But it's the gospel system is what is meant by faith, that, that we are justified. And so it is, it is forgiveness through his blood that was shed for our sins. That way, see here's the thing, the book of, Gal of uh, Galatians, six chapters, the book of Romans is 16 chapters. But in the book of Romans, you have very similar thought, but Paul enlarges upon that. For example, he'll talk in Romans 3 about the concept of propitiation, that justification is apart from the law, and yet it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. And he says in this way, by the, the blood of Christ, which he says is propitiation for our sins. In this way, Paul explains in Romans 3, and only in that way could God both be just and our justifier. He must be just. He's a holy God. But he is merciful. Uh, Josh, this past uh, uh, Sunday night, was talking about the kindness and the severity of God. There's justice, but he's merciful. He's loving, and so he provided graciously for our salvation. So that's what chapter 3 and 4 is about. And he even, in that context, brings up Abraham. Because the promise was made to Abraham, and he believed God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. The law came in afterward. It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come. And it served as a tutor. But now that, uh, now that faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor, the schoolmaster, the guardian. So, uh, and the analogy, the allegory of Galatians 4, we are children of the free woman, not children of, of the, the maidservant. The maidservant, it says of her, that she was to be cast out. And so, uh, the, the other, Isaac was the child of promise. And so, he draws that analogy to show that the true Israel of God are those who are of faith. And that's what the latter part of Galatians 3 says anyway, that those that are of faith are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here we go. First two chapters, I'm truly an apostle. The gospel I pre preach is by revelation of Jesus Christ. But then he defines the gospel. Chapters 3 and 4, it, the, the system is that of forgiveness through the blood of Christ, through faith in his name, and uh, not through the law. Because you remember, we've studied in the book of Acts chapter 15, that there were some, certain believers, but their background was that of the sect of the Pharisees, and they were telling uh, new converts, Gentiles, that unless they were circumcised and kept the law of Moses, they could not be saved. That's what Paul had in mind in the first chapter when he called this a perverted gospel. When you add to the gospel, or take away, they were adding to the gospel, but when you add to the gospel, you don't have the pure gospel. You have an adulterated gospel. You, you have a perverted gospel. 
And he says there's only one gospel. There's not another gospel to choose from. Okay, so that's our first two points. Now where we're at tonight, chapters 5 and 6 go together because these chapters show how those that are justified by faith, which he's been talking about in 3 and 4, but 5 and 6 then make the point, how then should we live? How should those who are justified by faith live? And he's going to make the point, for example, in chapter 5, uh, if you bite and devour one another, take heed lest you be consumed one of another. And so that's no way to live. See, a lot of people do that. In contrast, he talks in chapter 5 about walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. So here's a Spirit-filled life. He's not talking about speaking in tongues there or miraculous gifts. But it's, it's kind of like what Paul says in Ephesians 5, in verse 18, when he says, To be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What does the next verse say? What? There you go. Be filled with the Spirit, but the, it, that's not the end of the sentence. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What do Spirit-filled people do? They sing spiritual songs. They bear the fruit of the Spirit. We, we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So how should we live? That's the contrast, not the works of the flesh. Paul says, I've told you before, and I tell you again, that those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's, that's the works of the flesh. We've been set free from that. Don't go back to that. How should we live? Not with the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. Against such there is no law. So that's chapter 5. Now here we are in chapter 6. And uh, after talking about these qualities of bearing the fruit of the Spirit, and living therefore under the sway or under the influence of the Spirit of God, then he says, if someone is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual... That's what he's been talking about. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness or gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So that's one of those cases, like many times you can kind of ignore the chapter number because the thought is being continued. See what I mean? In other words, the, it's still the thought of how then should we live and this concept of uh, one who is submitting to the Lord, one who is a spiritually minded person, and so here you have a brother that's overtaken in a trespass. And so you don't say, well, that's no skin off my nose. You uh, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So that's, that's where we are. And, um, you know, every passage has a context. So as we look at Galatians 6, that's the context of Galatians 6. And, you know, it... When you get to chapter 5 and 6, it is so practical in terms of everyday living that, you know, you might be tempted, well, let's just, let's just go to chapters 5 and 6 to start with. Let's just get to the good stuff to start with. But everything that's been said is foundational. God wants us to understand these concepts of, of authority, of the gospel, of the revelation of Christ, of how we're justified and so those are things that need to be in place foundationally. Then you move on to, okay, what about from day to day, how are we to live? So it, it's not like uh, Paul is doing this as an afterthought. Again, it's spirit-guided, but that foundation, and, and there's a kind of a pattern that's involved. If you take the book of Romans I just mentioned, first 11 chapters, these profound, lofty principles in chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, so that you get to the practical application of 12 through 16. Book of Ephesians, the same thing. First three chapters, he goes to the God's eternal purpose, all the way back to eternity, and uh, all the blessings that are in Christ, and he talks about foreordination and predestination, and all these concepts, first three chapters, then in chapter 4, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, uh, uh, you're to walk worthy of the gospel wherewith you've been called. And so 
then you have the practical application and the walk, the walk there, a walking worthy of the gospel. You have the, the uh, not stealing, but working and helping husband, wife, parent, child, all those practical things. But, but there's that, uh, the instruction, the doctrinal principles, then that's what the practical application is based on, you see. You don't separate the two. So all the gospel is practical, but there are concept, God, concepts that God wants us to grasp that are the reason why we are to live as he directs us from day to day. So, hey Mark, how about reading for me so everybody in this room can hear it. Galatians 6, 1 through 10, please. Thank you. If a man is overtaken in a trespass, it's not like, well, that's not going to happen. Of course it can happen. We have an adversary who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, just looking for an opportunity. Just looking. So due to ignorance, I mean by that lack of knowledge, due to weakness, due to the deceptive power of sin. Do you remember over in Hebrews chapter 3, the point is made in verse 12 and 13, to exhort one another day by day so long as it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceptive. And so we can be, it's possible to be captured by its trap, the entrapment. It may be the persuasion or the bad example of others. Any, any number of factors could come into play, but if, any, if, if a brother's overtaken in a trespass, he, he's caught up in it. Now the thing is, we know that we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And I imagine that each one of you in your daily prayers will include, among other things, asking God to forgive you of every sin. Am I correct about that? I mean, if we're not praying for that, we need to be. I'm not minimizing that need, but that doesn't really seem to be what he's talking about here. This is, this is, this is when one may be overtaken and not be aware of it or or he's, he's, he's let off and he's, he's not seeing that himself. He's not coming back to his, his, his senses. I mean, it, it leaves it, it doesn't specify, you know, well, what's he doing? And that, that part could be any number of things, but the point, he's overtaken. He's, he's caught up in this. So, <clears throat> you who are spiritual, and as I've, as I've said, he's just been talking about if you look up a couple of verses in 525, if we live by the Spirit. Uh, look, I'm going backwards, but look at 5 verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit. And verse 16, walk in the Spirit. So one who is spiritual is one who's directed and controlled by the Spirit. 
And so he says to restore such a one. This, this word restore is an interesting word. Um, in Mark the first chapter it is used of disciples when they were mending the net, uh, the fishing net. So you can imagine the, the nets that they used in working and throwing overboard, pulling in all that back and forth motion, catching fish, maybe sometimes pulling in some debris that was there in the Sea of Galilee, but a tear results. And so this word to restore is used of mending the nets. It's also found in medical references where it would refer to a physician that was setting a broken bone. And so here, here is when, here's when a person spiritually is needing a bone set, a net mended. Here, here is when one needs to be mended and helped. And yet your attitude is so important. You may be the one that's spiritual. You're not in the sin. He's in the sin. But the text says, considering yourself, at first it says a spirit of gentleness. And then it says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In other words, if I'm trying to help somebody, my perspective is not looking down on them that look how righteous I am and buddy you've really messed up. You know, you just, you're just pretty well worthless here. There's no, no room for arrogance. There's no room for self-righteousness. So there's a spirit of gentleness. And then it's not a bad thing to say, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because none of us are above temptation and sin. And so each of us needs that warning. That's why that is given, because we need that warning. So that's just, uh, that's just as practical um, as it can be um, in terms of we are our brother's keeper. And if I were to give a related passage to this over in James chapter 5, uh, verse 19 and 20, James concludes by saying to his brethren that if you restore the brother who has strayed, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. James 5, 19 and 20. So it's a wonderful thing when a person never has obeyed the gospel if you can study with that person and teach them and uh, have part in their being baptized into Christ. We rejoice greatly when that happens. But it's also wonderful when someone who has strayed from the truth is brought back and he's restored. And God rejoices in that and we should as well. So it, it's just that kind of... Um, uh, you know, often when, when the elders of this congregation pray, that includes prayers of thanksgiving for the harmony and the peace and the love that is seen within the congregation. And this kind of verse here is speaking to that. It's, it's just saying that when that is the case, you, you don't just let someone continue uh, in, in, a, in a way that is harmful to them without making every effort to, to bring them back. Questions or comments? Anybody? Did you notice in verse 2, bear one another's burdens? And then in verse 5, for each one shall bear his own burden. Did you notice that? And so we're in a, we're in a section that um, where there are reciprocal responsibilities and then there are individual responsibilities that no one else can do. Actually, two different words are used here, by the way, and are so translated in some uh, versions. For example, the New King James says, bear one another's burdens, and verse 5 says, each one shall bear his own load. Um, over in Acts 27 and verse 10, when the storm was coming up and to lighten the ship, it says the cast overboard the cargo, that's the same word that's used here. You've got to carry your own cargo. Um, if, if a soldier's in the field, he has to carry his own pack. He has to carry his own stuff. And so that's, that's the idea, that, that there are some things that you're accountable for and nobody else can do that for you. But verse 2 isn't talking about that. Verse 2 is talking about 
those kinds of situations where there are needs, um, there are burdens that come along where we can be of assistance one to another. And I, I think of, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that might come to mind. Sometimes, sometimes people just, just really get discouraged. And there can be that, uh, if you can find that word fitly spoken, it's like apples of gold in that works of silver. That, that good word can be that good medicine that, that can help. It reminds me in, in 1 Samuel chapter 23 when um, David was f- fleeing from Saul and um, Saul was trying to kill David. And the text says that Jonathan looked David up and found him in the wilderness. And it says that Jonathan strengthened his hand in God. Uh, verse 16 of 1 Samuel 23. So when you... Um, when, when one is discouraged or in a weakened condition and you can strengthen that brother or sister's hand in God, you are a real friend. By the way, the world can't do that because you can't give what you don't have. And the, the, the true source of strength that we need is not something you can have outside of the, the, the Lord. This is why this, this is talking about brothers in Christ doing this. When death has come and taken a loved one from us, here again, that's a time that uh, we can't reverse the situation. But the Bible tells us to weep with those that weep. And we can, we can share in that sorrow. Jesus did that, didn't he? Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And so there, there are... Um, I think especially of, of, uh, of things like that. I think of what it says of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, it uses some metaphors. It says of Jesus that um, he would not break the bruised reed and he would not quench the smoking flax. And it's really not talking about reeds and candle wicks. It's talking about people that are like bruised reed, reeds that don't have much strength and the, the, the oil lamp with the, with the flax that was, uh, if it's smoking, something's wrong. It's running out of oil or it needs to be trimmed, but it's not supposed to do that. But it wouldn't take much to quench it. So what Jesus would do is, the idea is, if he'd put oil there, trim the wick, whatever, fan it into a flame. But it's talking about people. And this, this is the, I, I, I'm persuaded, the kind of thing that we're, that we're uh, looking at here. So many passages address that, just the concept of brotherly love. But you've got the warning that, again, always those warnings are there for a purpose. And and so verse 3 should keep somebody from feeling self-satisfied. He doesn't need any help from anybody. And he's not... See, a person that has the attitude he doesn't need help from anybody is usually not inclined to help anybody either. And so this is attacking the spirit of, of overconfidence, or I, I guess I should say a false sense of confidence. There's nothing wrong with having confidence. I've noticed it can sure be misplaced. I've seen people that have a whole lot of confidence that there's no apparent reason for it, but they've got a whole lot of confidence anyway. may be wrong, but they're very confident. And so here's someone that uh, he thinks himself to be something when he is nothing deceiving himself. And so the idea is to be, to be diligent, examining yourself, not, not boasting, um, uh, and, and so forth, as, as verse 4 says. And again, each one shall carry his own load, his own cargo. So there's some things, and, and by the way, we need that verse too, because some people have the idea that whatever it is, somebody else can fix it for them. Make this, make this go away. And uh, there's some things you have to come to terms with yourself. You're accountable to do that, and other people can't do it for you. And so it's, it's good to, to understand that as well. Josh?
Yeah, good points. And when we say each one shall carry, bear his own load or bear his own burden, we don't mean without the Lord's help. Always remember what Jesus said in John 15 and verse 5. He says, for without me you can do nothing. So it's, it's always through him and in him. Remember Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, Philippians 4 and verse 13. So, yeah, but, but in that case in point, Josh, nobody could bear that thorn of the flesh for Paul. It was something he had to come to terms with and with God's grace would, would do so. Now we shift gears a little bit, but it's still something very practical. It's, the text says, let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. The New American Standard says the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. This word, um, see that word share? See it in your Bible? It's... Uh, it is the Greek word koinonia. Um, that's the noun, actually. The share here is a verb, uh, which is koinoneo. Koinoneo is actually the noun, the verb part. But anyway, that, that you, you've heard of koinonia and koinoneo. It is um, it's the word for fellowship. It's found a lot of times. It translate, that's the word usually translated fellowship, sometimes communicate, um, share. But it's the idea of joint participation, of a sharing. And so here are those who are taught the word, and they are to share with those who teach them. I was reading some good material by Ken Green on Galatians, and he, he made a point I guess a lot of preachers could, could say. He said, he said, I, he said, I haven't preached on this much because he said I was afraid it would just be taken by as self-serving. You know, this is the principle that those who teach the gospel are to be supported by those that are taught. But he was quick to add that brethren had treated him well. It wasn't like he was complaining. He just said he hadn't done much teaching on it But then when he was dealing with what the passage says. By the way, it wouldn't just mean gospel preachers. And... Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul is talking about those, the elders that uh, serve well and contextually devoting themselves such that they also could be supported. And that's where he said, the scripture says, you're not to muzzle the ox while he treads out the grain. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said, the Lord ordained that those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Um, I've done several meetings in, in Canada one of the meetings that we did in a small congregation up at Sudbury. Um, the, the folks there uh, made a gift to me for my efforts to help support me in that. And I've, I haven't, haven't received this exact kind of thing before, but it was just a, a very nice, nicely written, beautiful piece of paper with the, the lettering that um, somebody had put together. I don't know who did it. But it was, it was this very passage. You let him that is taught communicate or share with him that teaches. And there was a check inside that, but it was, it was in connection with this passage of Scripture. I just thought that was, that was nice. It was just saying, we want to do what this passage says. And of course, I, I can say, and I've said many times, the church here at Hansville has, has been very kind and generous uh, to, to my support. But that's, that's the kind of thing that it's talking about. And as I say, a lot of a lot of passages deal with that. Um, the laborer, Jesus says, is worthy of his wages. Supporting a gospel preacher is not like relieving a needy saint. Supporting a gospel preacher is not um, benevolence. It is, it is support for work that is done that he might be able to, do, to devote himself to the work of the gospel. And I think you understand that. But, but I, I, I'm still, where I started with all that was, was the word sharing, which is the word for fellowship. And I really like to look at that relationship as one of fellowship. 
we are in fellowship together. We are joint participants in the Lord's work. And so uh, th that word is applied to this concept of, of teaching and the sharing with those who do the teaching. You know, I'm, I, I'm not opposed to anybody having comments. I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always fighting the clock and uh, have in mind directions that I want to take, but it's a class, please comment or ask questions. Keith, you have a very pleasant smile on your face. What are you thinking? I'm waiting for the next point. Okay, good. I mean, if you have to, you know. Now, when it comes to this, you can say, well, you know, uh, you know, people could be critical of that. And Well, he goes on to say, uh, God is not mocked. Whatever, here's the context. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So that's just, that's just part of the, of the uh, uh, this, the, we reap what we sow. And the person that's spiritually minded, he's sowing to the Spirit, he's going to reap what he sows. And uh, that includes the kind of thing that we're looking at, the teaching and sharing in verse 6. It's not, surely not limited to that. But you don't sow one thing and reap something else. You, you reap the thing that you sow. And so we're, that's true of all of life. And um, so you, you have that point brought out here. We know it's true in the natural world. You don't plant watermelon seed if you're trying to raise cotton. We all know the seed reproduces after its kind. Same thing is true spiritually. Verse 9, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Um, I was reading today from William Hendrickson, deceased William Hendrickson. It says, when the apostle says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, he is pointing his finger at a well-known weakness of human nature. Well-doing requires continued effort, constant toil. But human nature being fond of ease lacks staying power, is easily discouraged. This is especially true when results are not always apparent at once, when those who should help refuse to cooperate, and when no reward seems to ever be coming our way. It is entirely possible that it was especially this last thought, namely the apparent delay with respect to the fulfillment of the promise regarding Christ's return to reward His servants that trouble the Galatians. So the Apostle reminds them of the fact that we shall reap in due season that is, at the moment of time that is exactly right, not determined by us, but as fixed in God's eternal plan. Um, I, th I think there's some worthwhile thoughts in that. It, anything that requires continual effort, you can get tired of doing that. You can grow weary in well-doing. And so, uh, and, and as he mentioned, especially, see, we, we want, if, if, you, if you know you're doing the right thing, you, you appreciate feedback. You like to see results. You like to see something happen. But in doing what's right, you don't always see immediate results. You don't always get feedback that, that you might desire. So 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, if you uh, link this verse 9 back to the concept there in verse 6, you think about how often it was that Paul had indeed sowed the good news of the gospel and received no thanks for what he had done. Rather, he had received ridicule. We find often as it pertains to material support, there's oftentimes maybe just one or two congregations who, who fulfilled that portion. And I presume that Paul had I think now, so. The singular phrase used over and over again, one, one, one. Now he says, let us not grow weary in doing good. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's I think that's exactly right. I believe he's including himself there. Verse ten, thank you, Devin. Also, yes, please. The way that the that Jesus, but not the way that oh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because they're they're doing good, besides the fact it takes effort to do good, it's doing good with opposition. And we we wouldn't have this opposition if we would back off some of this, if we'd give in to these Judaizing teachers. So yeah, I, I, here again, those kind of contextual things, will, uh, reminders will help us. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. So this is that, all men, let us do good. Now doing good, Scriptures furnish us completely to every good work. We want to do good to all. The best thing I can do for somebody is to teach them the gospel. Wouldn't you agree? So as we do good to all men, that may involve helping someone with uh, groceries or medicine or transportation or something. I understand that. Or uh, cleaning up or doing some work that one can't do. That may involve that. But again, I'm persuaded that especially spiritual needs, let us do good unto all men, but especially those of the household of faith. He's reminding us of the attitude we should have toward our brethren, which is where we started out in chapter 6, verse 1. It's kind of like it, he's made a come full circle back to that. We're brethren and members of the household of faith. We're in the household of God, but it's here called the household of faith. The thing that distinguishes us from the world is what we believe. It's our faith. So here's the household of faith. So there's a special relationship there. Now, when he says all men, that would include if, if you're like the one we call the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Don't be like the Levite. Don't be like the priest. Uh, you know, you, who is my neighbor is being answered there. So that would pertain to this as well. Now, in the couple of minutes we have left, see with what letters I have written to you with my own hand. And so then you have these closing verses here. And what happens at this point in the letter, let me, let me tell you what, apparently is happening. Paul has been dictating. At this point he takes the pen. Let me read you this from G.W. Hansen. Careful studies of thousands of letters written in Paul's day have led to the discovery that most of the letters exhibit two styles of handwriting. A refined style of a trained secretary in the body of the letter and a more casual style of the author in the conclusion. It appears that it was common practice for letters to be written by dictation to secretaries. The author would personally write only a few lines at the end of the letter. Usually these concluding lines in the author's hand summarize the cardinal points of the letter. Evidently the author's summary of the main points served not only to verify he had actually made those points in his dictation to his secretary, but also to underline the points he wanted his readers to remember. For this reason, the conclusion of a letter often provided important interpretive clues to the entire letter. Well, that's just saying it's a very common practice, but what Paul is doing here is he's, like he mentions to the Thessalonians that we talked about, one of the distinguishing marks, he said, of my letters is my signature. And so here at this point, he's writing, but he has to use large letters. We could speculate. He had told the Galatians, if it were possible, you would have given your own eyes to me. It, it may be something about vision, for whatever reason. He's not saying the book of Galatians is a large letter, because it's not. But when he takes the pen, he's having to write in large letters. But that part is Pauline. Concluding verses, we'll take those next time, and then answer the questions which you now have. Thank you all for your participation.
one three zero one is the number we'll be using after the Lord's invitation. I don't suppose it's any secret that tomorrow is July fourth. I don't suppose it's any secret either that we celebrate that day because of our country's independence. It's a day that's talked about a lot because it has significance to us as Americans. If the odds makers would have been taking bets, which wasn't possible at the time, but if they would have, the odds would have been maybe a thousand to one that the American troops could have won the war. They were outnumbered about four to one. The weaponry that was used was far superior to that that the American troops had. Their generals were better. They were better equipped. The Redcoats should have won that war. And so it's often touted as one of the greatest victories of all time happened in this country. We celebrate that tomorrow. But why did it happen? How could that happen? If we're so outnumbered, far superior troops that we're up against, better equipment, how can we defeat them? I want to tell you tonight that they determined in their heart, they had a mentality that they wanted freedom. And they would have freedom at any cost. So when these men went into this war and these battles, they realized very quickly, my life may be taken today, but I'm fighting for freedom. That's significant. And it should be significant to us as Americans. But, does that compare to, to our spiritual freedom that we have? Should it compare? There are comparisons. On one side, there's no comparison. On the other side, there are comparisons made. There are comparisons made in the Scripture. If we read from Ephesians 6, and verse, beginning in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Are you equipped, brethren, sisters? Are you equipped? That's the question. We have far superior equipment than those soldiers had in the American Revolution. Far superior. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist the, de the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the uh, preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have the Word of God. We have the power of God. Paul talks a lot to Timothy about the good fight, about being a soldier of Christ. 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
quickly I'll turn to Psalm 73, beautiful scripture. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We have the equipment necessary to overcome. We have the equipment that those soldiers of the American Revolution did not have to overcome, but they overcame. We don't have to look for it. It is in God's Word. And then finally, in uh, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, a very familiar scripture, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. The ultimate freedom is freedom from sin. But it required the ultimate sacrifice in the blood of our Savior. I can assure you, we are equipped. If you are not equipped tonight to face the trials of everyday living, as we have to do, if you have not identified with the blood of Christ in baptism, if the gospel calls you, please come as we stand and sing.